All right. So um, as Scott had said earlier, advanced care planning is the topic of our discussion today. And um, there's a couple of things that, you know, just as an introduction, we want to say. And that, um, uh, I want to just make sure I have my notes going in the right direction. Let's see if I can get the slides going in the right direction. Green button. Uh, it, the green button goes on. Oh, there we go. And now we've gone too far. No. Okay. Understanding advanced care planning. That's where we are. Okay. Uh, the, there's some basic information we want to kind of just share about advanced care planning. And that starts with the fact that January 1st, 2016, the Centers for Medical, Medicare and Medicaid Services began paying for volunteer advanced care planning with our doctors. And what this means is that um, after you reach the age of 65, typically, but sometimes it can be sooner if your health uh, situation uh, deems it necessary, you will begin being invited to participate in this advanced care discussion, um, this advanced care planning discussion. Um, it is sometimes referred to as a wellness visit. And it, it can be very beneficial. And we see the, the value in it. But you have to appreciate that, the, depending on who your doctor is, can um, influence his approach to this visit. Um, advanced care planning should be done with health care providers, absolutely. And we support that. But I do believe, and one of the key things I hope you take away from today, is that any advanced care planning that we do must start with conversations with our families so that this begins a, almost a, a, a new paradigm where, as a culture, we talk about death. We talk about aging. Um, in this culture, we tend to not speak about these things. We, we refer to somebody as past. Nobody has passed. They died. Mm -hmm. And yet it's a scary word. It's a scary topic. But bringing the, bringing the topic of death under the idea of advanced care planning, the doctors want to do it, so it's wise for us to start with our families. We also need, um, when I was, uh, I was listening to a TED Talk by a, a geriatric doctor a couple of years ago, I guess it was now, and he made a comment that just, it was one of those comments that really stuck with me, and it's the third bullet there. He, he said, we need to recognize that few people die a sudden death. Some do, but it's not the most common. Few do. More people die from an illness, but most will die of, age, of, of old age complications. And it was such a simple statement but a very profound truth. We all kind of expect that, you know, we're some, I, I don't know what you expect in terms of how you're going to die or when you're going to die. But I used to just think that one day I wouldn't wake up. And now, given the work we do and, and, and the care we give to some of our older um, loved ones, I have regular conversations with my family about you know, one of my favorite questions to ask is, when you think about aging and, and you think about physical impairment or memory impairment, which would you prefer? Because both have a cost. Both are a form of suffering. Both are difficult. Um, I care for two elderly woman, women, and, and one of them has Alzheimer's and one of them has dementia. And... The, the quality of life is there for them, but we can no longer carry on much conversation because there's, there's, no, um, uh, there's nothing to pin down their thoughts, and, and conversations can, can really get very um, creative. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could think of a quick one that Evelyn shared with me just recently, but she... She'll often start a sentence and, and start like she's asking you a question, and then she just kind of drops the words and never finishes. 
And, and so there are times when I think, oh, I'd really rather go for physical pain than losing my memory. And then there are other times that there's simple joy and I think, eh, maybe it's the other way. But beginning to think about what does our own aging and dying process look like? It's not a natural thing to do, but it's important that we begin to do it and having those conversations with family. And I also think it's important to note the final point there on the bullet points is that we need to realize that advanced care planning is different than advanced directives. Advanced directives are things like living wills, having a power of attorney for health care. Um, those are the two main ones, or sometimes those things are referred to as advanced directives. Um, advanced care planning is very different from that. Their advanced care planning, in essence, creates one of those types of documents. All right, so that's the first one. And then, Scott, you're going from there? Or, oh, and i got to change the slide. <laughs> yes, there we go. As Georgette has said, advanced care planning can be and often is a good thing as it requires us and puts us in a place to really have those conversations and think about those things that we need to think about and those conversations we need to have that are often rather uncomfortable to have so that we can talk about as much as we can foresee things, how we would like things to be handled for us or having conversations with our loved ones, those dear to us, um, in the case of major illness, in the case of aging, which will happen to most of us, and in the case of dying, which will happen to all of us, um, how we would like things to look, how, what, what are the things that are most important to us? So it raises for us questions like, what are your end of life goals? What is most important to you when you, are, when you or I or we are at, reach that place in our lives? What are the things that are most important to us? And that can be sometimes big picture stuff, but it can also be very specific things like if I know that I am nearing the end of life and, for instance, I am confined to a bed, I am incapacitated, um, I want these basic things done for me each day in terms of basic hygiene needs. I want my hair combed. I want to be shaved. Um, I would like this type of music playing. I would like, um, you know, visits, or I wouldn't like visits, you know, all those types of things that really are very unique and individualized to the people that God has made us to be. And we want to do things in a way that affirms the highest quality of life possible. Now, we have to be careful with the term quality of life because that has become a misused term very often in our culture. And, and the, the idea is, the, the, the incorrect idea that has developed is that quality of life equates with value of life. And while the two are related, they are also separate because the value of life, our lives as human beings created in the image of God, is objective and is assigned to us by God who created us in his image. It is not subjective based on the so-called quality of our lives. Um, and again, what is quality of life for some people is very different than it is for others. And you really don't want someone from the outside telling you what is a quality life for you. You want to be making that decision as much as is possible for yourself. So advanced care planning can be good. Um, it can also be bad if, if it goes the wrong direction because it can remove um, decision-making in real time from us or those closest to us, and it can set in place um, trajectories and plans and orders that become very difficult legally or medically to deviate from. One of the problems with certain forms of advanced care planning, and we'll talk about these going forward here in a little while, is that they don't take into consideration all of the nuances that can develop with, with health issues and with aging and the dying process. So often, for instance, with advanced directives, they are characterized or framed as a list of yes, no questions. If this happens, yes, I want this. If this happens, no, I do not want that. Very black and white with no middle ground to take into consideration the uniqueness of every situation. 
The, I, I would share an example very briefly with my wife's grandmother, which if you've heard me do this presentation before, you've heard me share this. My wife's grandmother in her early 80s had a pretty serious stroke and was in a what we would call a comatose state. And the doctor said that she will never come out of that state. This was in Oregon, which is not a good place for this to happen, um, even back then. Um, and she, she was in a comatose state and she had well-intentioned but misled an advanced directive that said, if I am basically incapacitated, I do not want a feeding tube. All of a sudden, they had said she was going to die from this stroke. The doctor said she would never recover. If she did recover, she would be in a, I despise the term, persistent vegetative state. Well, this started to, to drag out, and Tammy and I, my wife, were back here in Maryland coming out of our skin, and there's nothing anyone could do because this advanced directive was in place. And we realized she was showing some signs of improvement or stability, but we also knew that she was starving to death, and her body could process and assimilate the food. And the doctors, you know, had said again, she will never come out of this. She's going to be in a persistent vegetative state. And all of a sudden, one day, about 10 days into this, her grandmother opened her eyes, looked at her sons at the bedside, at the bedside and said, I'm hungry. I want something to eat. And she lived another seven years and died when she was 90 years old. So case in point. Um, the last qualifier I would have in this whole piece of advanced care planning is it is best that you have, we, obviously, patient-physician relationship is incredibly important and having a physician that you trust. But we need to work very hard as much as is possible to not develop an adversarial relationship with our physician or the physicians that are caring for our loved ones. That being said, we need to be willing to ask the hard questions, not take dismissive answers. And when the time comes, if there are issues, to dig our heels in and stand for what we know is right and true. All right. Okay. Uh, a couple of just simple notes to to this whole discussion in terms of what is or isn't. Um, advanced care planning is not legally required, nor do patients have to have an advanced directive before they can be admitted into a hospital or care facility. This is probably one of the greatest misunderstandings because the facilities and the people that run, whether it's hospital or some sort of um, nursing home, they want these in place. And they put a great deal of pressure on us to fill out and some kind of form so they have, in essence, a directive. Um, and so it is important for you to know you're right, that you do not have to fill out a form before they can admit you. Um, I saw this firsthand with my father. We were in the emergency room. We weren't sure if he was having a heart attack or what was going on. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, um, after being there since 6 p.m., the admitting doctor came in. Now, this is a doctor that just looked at his chart, never talked to him, never asked him any questions, just simply came in and said, Mr. Nutting, I noticed you don't have a DNR, a do not resuscitate order on your medical chart. And... Um, he said, I think you should have one because if you have a massive heart attack, you obviously don't want to be left in a vegetative state. So we'll, you know, if you sign a DNR, we won't do anything. It was four o'clock in the morning. My father had been in and out of sleep. And I looked at the doctor and I said, excuse me, my father will never be a piece of asparagus or a tomato. This is not the time to have this conversation. We are not signing a DNR. I, and I stayed there because I was afraid something like this would happen. The doctor did not acknowledge me, did not even look at me. He looked at my father and he said, Mr. Nutting, I really think that we should have you sign a DNR. And I said, excuse me, sir. We are not signing anything. We're not having this conversation. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. Admit my father. The doctor looked at my dad again and said the same thing. And my dad just laughed and he said, He's, she's just like her mom and you're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to sign anything. Now, had I not been there, my dad would have signed the DNR because I asked him that later. So I want us to understand this very important fact. It, it's the benefit of the health care providers to get us to fill out that form, not us. Okay, the next point we want to make. 
the history of advanced care planning. Um, the old method of treatment was based on the diagnosis or the illness that the patient was dealing with. The doctor focused on the illness and the treatment was about healing the patient. Now, if stages of treatment intensified or if the disease progressed, then the treatment would also progress. What would happen then is the doctor, once he knew that the treatment might have plateaued, he would then start to work on how to address the disease and keep the patient comfortable um, and, and begin to talk to the patient about preparing for dying and realizing that there's obviously going to be a fear associated that for that for many of those patients. So the, the, the focus was on the doctor helping the patient. And you know, with medical technology now, we can live so much longer. I mean, we can treat so many more diseases. We're living longer, but we're not stopping to think about what these treatments can lead to long term. So the doctor used to be kind of in control, and or he, he believes he's in control, maybe is a better way to put it. And yet now, as, these, as we're trying to teach people to have conversation, the doctor is acknowledging that there's almost a paradox or this kind of like um, odd place he gets where if he starts discussing long-term care in, uh, too early in the treatment process of the disease, the patient thinks that the doctor doesn't think there's any hope for healing or recovery. So the doctor feels compelled to maybe not say anything when he should be. Or they can begin discussing comfort care later in the process, and then he, the patient will misconstrue that the doctor is saying, I'm giving up on hope, you know, I'm giving up hope, I'm, I'm not going to try to continue to help you. So the doctor is kind of feeling a little pressure. So what, what we're realizing is that sometimes doctors don't necessarily want to get into some of the more difficult conversations as well. Because neither situation is really valid. And we have to help um, both the patient and the doctor look at these scenarios of what their condition is and what are the pros and cons of if they do get well or if they don't. In other words, the conversations have to be more comprehensive than just simply, well, here's what we're going to keep trying, and we're going to try everything we can to keep you alive at all costs. And if this radiation doesn't work, we're going to go to this chemotherapy, and then there's drug trials and this, that, and the other, where in that conversation needs to be built, what are your values? What are your priorities? Do you really want to be kept alive at all costs, or do you want more of a natural process? So the conversations can't be either or. They have to, we have to learn how to have conversations that are much more um, big picture and holistic. Okay, so um, d d going back and forth, we, we uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna start the topics. Um, all right, so these are all the different terms that we're gonna quickly go through um, to kind of begin to prepare you for the types of conversations or the types of um, phrases that you'll hear if you have advanced care planning with your doctor. The first one is medical or physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. And it's often referred to as MOLST or PULST. Um, that's the shorthand for it. And what this per, um, particular uh, uh, product is, um, because it's, it's a form, and the idea behind it, think about these words, physician or medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. These become the default medical orders if you are, um, if you're dealing with either a terminal illness, a, a long-lasting illness, um, the doctors will start to basically try to come up with some default medical treatments, medical orders, so that they don't even have to be present. As long as their signature is on the form, all they need to do is basically put their orders in that form, and they can be followed regardless of what you're actually going through or presenting as a problem. 
this doesn't make sense to me. I'm, I'm sorry, I just cannot wrap my arms around this kind of blanket idea that we're going to come up with a medical orders and we're going to put it on this piece of paper and regardless of what you're actually dealing with, these are the orders to, of how you're going to be treated. Who does that? We don't even, <laughs> I can't even come up with a good enough analogy at the moment. But the idea that we can give a blanket order without understanding all the nuances of what can possibly show up as a complication, to me, it's irresponsible. But it is very common that any time you are in a hospital setting with an elderly patient, a patient that has any level of dementia or Alzheimer's, um, or a, a, a cancer patient, you will be given this form pretty darn quickly. Um, I have been uh, presented with it multiple times and when I'm dealing with Betty or Evelyn in the hospital. I just got a call last, uh, two weeks ago from a husband out in, I think it was Colorado. His wife is facing stage four pancreatic cancer. And he has been asked by the hospice to fill out this form with his wife or that they're to get this form filled out. And he called me and he said, I don't think we want to fill this out. It doesn't feel right. And I said, follow your gut. Um, but it's a natural thing. And the idea behind it is they, it's on a brightly colored piece of paper, usually like shocking pink. And it's cardstock, so it's real strong. And they put it on your refrigerator if you're a patient at home so that if EMS comes in, they know to look on the refrigerator. They don't even contact the doctor. They don't consult anybody. They don't ask the family, what do you want? They simply looked for the pulse form, and then they conduct their business according to that form. It can also be used in the patient's record, and in which case then it's, um, whether they're in hospice or, or um, home care or whatever, it is going to be um, the basis for upcoming treatment. Comfort care is different. And it is a, in a very important part of medical care at the end of life. It is care that helps soothe or calm or relax or, or address the pace, patient's pain, the patient's um, discomforts. But the idea behind it was that it would be dignified and that it would, um, in essence, allow um, uh, prevent suffering but allow the patient to remain engaged as much as possible based on pain and other factors. Unfortunately, comfort care um, now has a, um, a, a phrase that's all sometimes um, attached to it, and that term is terminal sedation, where they basically, the form of comfort care is to sedate you to death. Um, so that, in essence, instead of really addressing the actual patient's level of pain, they just start pumping morphine or whatever. I mean, there's lots of different drugs they can use. And, and the idea is that they suppress the respiratory system, the cardiac system, and in essence, slowly euthanize the patient. Terminal sedation is never comfort care. Comfort care is a good thing. But when they start over-medicating, it becomes a dangerous thing. Um, hospice care. Hospice care is a very common thing that we're all familiar with, and it's designed to give supportive care to people in their final phase of a terminal illness and focuses on comfort and quality of life rather than curing. It's very similar to, uh, to comfort care. Um, and hospice can be both at home or in a facility. Palliative care is the other um, topic, and that is the, where you're actually focused on relieving symptoms, especially pain. Um, palliative care is designed to, is really, I always think of it as almost pain management but it can also address additional um, symptoms that the patient may be dealing with. Now, the problem that we have, especially in Canada, is that comfort care, palliative care, and hospice are phrases that the medical community 
will often interchange. And one of the key things, and I mean, the, the, in Canada, they often will say hospice palliative care or palliative, you, they, they'll bring the words together. So one of the things we recommend is you always have to ask the medical provider for a definition of what he's actually saying. When you say comfort care, what do you actually mean? Does that include removal of food and fluids? Does that include pain management? Ask questions. So um, I'm going to now turn this over, and you're going to go ahead and take on the next group. <laughs> I would just piggyback on what Georgette just said. How palliative care in relation to comfort care and, and those things relates varies from health system to health system, and that's serving as a chaplain in several different health systems. I've seen that. For instance, one context where I served, you had a palliative care team. One side of the palliative care team worked, and they interfaced a lot, but one side worked primarily with patients who were dealing with end-of-life issues. Uh, the other component of the palliative care team worked with pain and symptom management for folks who, in a lot of cases, like trauma patients, were going to have a relatively um, positive and long-term recovery. So it, it varies immensely, but in other places, it's just end of life. So you, as George said, you've really got to kind of get them to define and parse out what those things mean. Let's talk about a few more orders. Um, do not resuscitate or a DNR, also known as a no code or allow natural death, is a legal order written either in the hospital or, in, or, on, or on a legal forum to withhold cardiopulmonary resuscitation or advanced life support in respect of the wishes of the patient in case their heart were to stop. This is appropriate at certain junctures. My father is now a DNR. My father has advanced metastatic cancer that started in his kidney, which is now in his lungs and in his pelvic bones. And it would not be appropriate if his heart stops. I mean, my dad said to me the other day as I was leaving the house on Monday, I was, they live in Maryland, and he said, I want you to pray that the Lord will take me. Um, but there are times when this is appropriate. Um, as Georgette talked about, it's important with our family members to clarify what do you want at this juncture in life? And that will change at different times. And, and CPR, especially on an elderly person who has, or even a young person who has very advanced disease, um, it is brutal. Um, you know, the, the saying in the, in, in the medical community is, if you ain't breaking ribs, you ain't doing CPR. And it's true to do CPR effectively. Um, and I have watched families where I think they took steps very prematurely making someone a DNR, but I've also seen the other side of that where medical care was clearly futile. You're dealing with, you know, a 98-year-old lady who's about this thick, and the family just will not come to grips with the reality that God's saying it's time for her to leave this world, and, and you watch the team two or three or four times through a code have to do CPR on that person, which is horrible for the person, but also, um, frankly, in support of the medical community, it's very traumatic for them too under those types of circumstances. It, it, those kinds of things are very difficult to do because you feel and you hear the ribs breaking when you're doing CPR. Um, so you need to know what you're dealing with with a DNR in terms of what the life circumstances are and you need to know what is most appropriate and think that through with, for yourself or your loved ones at the particular juncture you've reached in life. Futility of care is when the physician deems treatment to be in vain, not helpful to the patient, and it gives hospital doctors the right to withhold treatment, which can include food and fluids. There is a point where we reach futility of care, but this is also a problematic area because, again, it depends on the health system, it depends on the healthcare context, it depends on the attending physician. But in some cases, depending on their worldview, doctors can arrive at what they interpret to, be, interpret to be futility of care, often based on what they deem is an appropriate level of quality of life, very prematurely. And so you need to be aware of and be ready to step in and advocate for a loved one or for yourself, if you can speak for yourself, with these types of issues. Medical aid in dying, we heard about a little bit this morning, um, also known as assisted death, is really assisted suicide to its opponents 
And it is the practice in which a terminally ill adult with less than six months to live, and that probably is going to be changing, may request a lethal dose of drugs from his or her doctor for self-administration to bring about death if she, he or she feels that the dying process has become unbearable. We also have terminal sedation, which is the decision to keep dying patients comfortable um, who cannot be kept comfortable in any other way um, by making them unconscious until they die. Um, just causing someone to go unconscious, from my perspective, is a huge problem. If in the process of appropriately, and watch my terms, or my wording, appropriately administering pain medications to alleviate symptoms, it leads to the person going into a deeper sleep. That can be appropriate, but there can also be times when, as, as Georgette talked about a few minutes ago, um, in some cases, certain doctors or certain healthcare systems will just kind of keep bumping up the doses and keep titrating morphine or whatever the drug is, knowing that it is going to suppress systems and hasten death. So you need to be aware of that. Dehydration and starvation is a method to hasten death and can even occur when food and fluids are removed as medical treatment. There, this is something that, that happens nowadays very quickly, and again, in some health systems. Oh, we're not going to do a feeding tube. Oh, no, we're not going to hydrate the person. I guess my question is, is it ever appropriate to withhold nutrition or fluid? And my answer is, yes, there are some times that it is. Because especially with folks with advanced cancer, advanced kidney failure, they reach the point where their body cannot actually even process the nutrition or the fluids anymore, and it actually causes additional pain and additional suffering. But that is the threshold, not, oh, this person's not doing well, this person's terminal, therefore we should withhold it. We need to be aware, though, this is also an evolving field, and the definitions of artificial nutrition and hydration are evolving as well. And while it is still very much a minority view, there are people in the medical field, there are people in the pro-euthanasia movement who now define artificial nutrition and hydration as if a person, say, with advanced dementia cannot, doesn't have the wherewithal to reach with a spoon and feed themselves, they should not receive any assistance because that qualifies as artificial nutrition or hydration. This is evolving. Um, actually, there's some really good information on the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops website about some of this, if you ever want to go there and look around. But you need to be aware that that is the frame of reference for some people, and it's evolving. Brain dead and har harvesting organs. You heard a lot about this morning. Brain death, properly defined medically, is that there is no brain function, no brain stem function, and the person is legally dead. You need to understand whether, the, whether what has been decided is valid or not. When a person is declared brain dead by a physician, they are legally dead from, from the legal perspective, whether they are dead or not, and therefore everything stops. Let's talk finally about persistent vegetative state, a term that Georgette and I both despise. It's supposedly a disorder of consciousness in which patients with severe brain damage are in a state of partial arousal rather than true awareness. Terry Schiavo was defined this way. After four weeks in a vegetative state, the patient is classified as being in a persistent vegetative state. One story, um, and I'll turn it back over to Georgette. I sat in at one of the hospitals where I served with a family whose a family whose um, loved one was being defined or diagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state. I happened to have, we had um, Catholic seminarians who were doing pastoral service at the hospital. One of my students was with me that day, and I had had, he sat in on this conference with me, and one of the members of the medical team and the person from the organ procurement agency, so they oversee you know, the process of organ donation, talked to the family and said, she has no upper brain activity. Um, her upper brain is dead. The EEGs show that her upper brain is dead. This was on a Wednesday. And she is progressing to brain death. The family was um, strongly encouraged to consider organ donation. The family said, we are not close to the idea of organ donation but we're not at that point yet and we want to give it some time.
There was some pushback, but they did honor the family's wishes. That was Wednesday, and I was doing chaplaincy part-time. I came in on a Monday and said, so whatever happened to Mrs. So-and-so? Oh, she woke up on Friday and walked out of the hospital on Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. That's yeah. yeah. And that's what we have to be careful. That's why we have to be careful. All right, so um, instead of just thinking about advanced care planning, let's think about Christian advanced care planning. What does that look like? Um, I think that we need to see that there is an important difference, and it's a difference that we have some level of control over because we can initiate it, we can guide it. It means having honest discussions with ourselves about our own fears, about our own um, experiences with death and dying, and then how that's coloring our opinion or our um, fears about dying or death, um, while prayerfully seeking God's guidance for each healthcare situation. Um, having uh, Betty and Evelyn as uh, two dear friends, um, uh, one of them is our daughter's godmother. That's how we got close. Neither one of them have, were ever married or have any um, children. So we really became their surrogate family. And, um, and, and so as they began to age and we saw some early signs of memory loss, I started having conversations with them once they, we had had the conversation about um, who was going to care for them as they got older. Um, they had asked me to be the trustee of their foundation that they wanted to put together after they died. And I said, well, who's taking care of you before you die? And they looked at each other and they looked at me and they said, well, the, we'll take care of each other. And I said, well, that's great, but what if both of you might become incapacitated, never dreaming that really they both would? Um, and so what we did is we began to have conversations based on the people and the friends that we shared and what they were going through. And we had one dear friend who had um, a heart issue, and she chose not to have an operation to correct it. And she died about two weeks later, but she was 88 and she was ready to die. She had lived a full life, she loved life, but after her husband died about five years earlier, she would wake up every day and go, damn, I'm still alive. And so when she had this heart issue come up and her kids were ensuring and you know encouraging her to go through the operation, she said, I don't wanna to try to recover from open heart surgery. And I don't want to artificially prevent what is happening naturally with God. God allowed my heart to do this. I'm trusting him that he'll take me when he knows I'm ready. And she died sitting in her garden a few weeks later. Um, but that was a prayerful decision she had reached. And so with Betty and Evelyn, as I go through every hospital, um, whether we're, we get, um, what do you call it when you get, sent to the hospital, whether you get um, admitted. admitted. Thank you, I don't know why I lost that one. Um, whether you get admitted or you get sent back home, the doctors now have kind of worked with me enough and they'll, they know that I'm not going to sign any blanket forms and that we take every situation as it comes in terms of dealing with their needs. They're, um, neither one of them are capable anymore of making those decisions, so it does fall to me. And I do um, really pray, God, show me. Do I intercede with this medication, with this? Do we use this? You know, how far do we go with these things? And as they get older, the interventions um, become um, less. Um, this summer, we did put Evelyn on oxygen. But that is the only intervention, and as well as some medications, that either one of them are dealing with. And when... The doctors have asked me different things. We make it very clear that based on the need is when we'll discuss that topic. Um, and I think that we have, to, we have to identify our priorities of how we want to live and how we want to die. Um, and as Scott said earlier, asking some very simple questions like, what are your end of life goals? When I asked Evelyn and Betty this question, um, these are two women that have been lifelong friends. The one, uh, Betty, 
actually was the first female head of Gulf Oil, um, the personnel department. She broke the glass ceiling. Very, very brilliant, smart, um, highly achieved woman. And um, both her and Evelyn, they both said, when, when I asked about that, they said, we, we just want to stay in the apartment and we want to stay together. So everything that we, the, made, the decisions that we had to make, or when Evelyn still wanted to drive, and um, we knew she shouldn't be driving, yep. I would simply say, but let's talk about your goals. If you guys want to stay together and stay in the house, that means we have to keep you all safe. And if you go out and drive and get into an accident, that could, that could change that. Oh, and so she would say, okay, well, you know, then therefore the goal became the decision-making process and, and helped. It wasn't Georgette saying, no, you can't do something. It was reminding them of their goals. So that's really become to me a very important thing because it takes the onus off of family members to control things or to dictate things. Um, and so we have to be thinking about what, what do we want and then having those conversations with those that are dear to us. And as I said earlier, uh, we would use other people's circumstances to have conversations about, well, what would you want to do in those circumstances? So it was, it's given me a better sense of what their worldviews are and what their priorities are related to different things. And in none of the conversations we ever had, did they ever say, I want you to withhold food and fluids. <laughs> and, and so those are kind of some basic, simple things, which are often the most critical things that the medical system wants to remove. So um, these kind of questions can have great impact. And um, gosh, oh, where, here it is. Um, to help families have these conversations, Anglicans for Life wrote this curriculum called Embrace the Journey. And it's an eight-week program, and it really does walk you through all this stuff um, in depth, and it does address the um, practical issues, the advanced directive issues, funeral planning. Um, and then what we did is we created this little booklet, and it says, buy, and every person that goes through the program fills this out themselves. So it's every every individual gets this. Couples can work off of the binder or, you know, as a, an individual. But what this does is it has information to start to talk through with family about those goals. It has a kind of different scenarios. Well, what would you want in that scenario? It, it helps create conversations so that when, if or when you get into a situation where your family has to make, be making decisions for you, they have some sense of what your desires are and most importantly, it won't allow either one of them to end up bickering or any of them to be bickering about, well, mom told me she wanted that or mom told me she wanted that. Or it, it allows for these conversations to be inclusive with all family members and it allows what can be very crisis-oriented times to have a lot more calm in God's presence. And as Christians, that, to me, is a wonderful legacy to leave to our children and our families. So, all right, um, Christian, uh, so recognizing the importance, uh, best approach. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> playing ping pong with this. <laughs> okay, Christian Advanced Care uh, planning the best approach. We believe um, at Anglicans for Life, we do not encourage people to fill out living wills. Uh, we believe that living wills can be interpreted by different people. Um, different doctors um, can interpret what you intended very differently. May I have something there? Yeah. Just, and living wills typically, again, frame things. It's all or nothing. If this is the case, I want this. If this is the case, I don't want this. And it doesn't allow for all those nuanced considerations that really do come into play. Exactly. So what do we recommend? We recommend appointing somebody to serve as your power of attorney for health care. Now, this is different than your power of attorney for finance. But again, this person is your advocate, your spokesperson. If you're incapacitated, they become your voice. Therefore, they need to have your worldview, understand it, and be able to articulate it and advocate for it. That's very important. 
Um, an alternative to the power of attorney is to have someone serve as an advocate, especially during patient doctor visits, um, if there's treatments, tests, medications, just keeping somebody kind of on top of it. Um, one of the caregivers that we have working with us serves as the advocate if I'm out of town and not available. Um, so having somebody that can kind of serve as a backup to the power of attorney. Um, keep communication and discussions ongoing based on changes in health care. Educate yourself and your loved ones about death in the Lord. This is a great time for evangelism. When somebody's facing death, they're wondering what happens when they cross over, you know, all those euphemisms. This is the opportunity. Um, one of my dear friends, her parents were brilliant, both of them PhDs, and she prayed all the years um, for them to come to know the Lord. And within six months of both of them dying, they each accepted Jesus. So it's never too late. So appreciate that the opportunity is there to share Jesus. Healthcare technology advances, healthcare technology keeps advancing. So as we live longer, um, we have to be more thoughtful about using that technology wisely. Um, Anglicans for Life, because this topic comes up so often, I forgot to forward the thing. Um, because this topic comes up so often, we have come up with a, a little saying um, to help simplify this concept. And it's this, we must neither seek every artificial medical intervention available to live forever, nor accelerate death by hastening it, hastening it and imposing our will or time frame. Death must be natural and in God's time. And that's what we really want for everyone. Death in God's time. So that wraps up our presentation.